chasing the sea monster. Our frigate wanted to go back, but an earthly animal came to us with a speed double our own. We gasped, more stunned than afraid, we stood mute and motionless. The animal caught up with us, played with us, it made a full circle around the frigate and wrapped us in sheets of electricity that were like luminous dust. At any instant, it could have dashed against us. Meanwhile, I was surprised to see that our warship was fleeing, not fighting. I commented on this to Commander Forigate. His face, ordinarily so emotionless, showed great astonishment. Professor Oranex, he answered me. I don't know what kind of fearsome creature I'm up against. I don't want my frigate running foolish risks in all this darkness. Besides, how should we attack this unknown creature? How should we defend ourselves against it? Let's wait for daylight and then we'll play a different role. The whole crew stayed on their feet all night long. No one even thought of sleeping. Unable to compete with the monster's speed, our frigate, the Abraham Lincoln, slowed down. For its part, the animal mimicked the frigate, simply rode with the waves, but did not leave the field of battle. However, near midnight it disappeared, or to use a more appropriate expression, it went out like a huge glowworm. Had it fled from us? We didn't know and were filled with fear and hope at the same time. But at 12.53, a deafening hiss could be heard, resembling the sound made by a water spout expelled with tremendous intensity. By then, Commander Farragut Ned Land and I were on the after deck, peering eagerly into the darkness. Tell me, Ned Land, isn't that the noise cetaceans make when they spurt water from their blowholes? The very noise, sir, but this one's way louder. So there can be no mistake. There's definitely a whale lurking in our waters. Near two o'clock in the morning, the core of light reappeared five miles away from the Abraham Lincoln. We stayed on the alert until daylight, getting ready for action. Whaling gear was set up along the railings. Our chief officer loaded the blunderbusses, which can launch harpoons as far as a mile and long duck guns with exploding bullets that can wound and kill even the most powerful animals. Ned Land was content to sharpen his harpoon, a dreadful weapon in his hands. At six o'clock, day began to break, and with the dawn's early light, the animal's electric glow disappeared. At seven o'clock, a very dense morning mist spread around us. Our best spy glasses were unable to pierce it. The outcome? Disappointment and anger. At eight o'clock, the mist rolled away and the horizon grew wider and clearer. Suddenly, Ned Land's voice could be heard. There's the thing in question. Aston to port. The harpooner shouted. Every eye looked towards the point indicated. There, a mile and a half from the frigate, a long blackish body emerged a meter above the waves. Quivering violently, its tail was creating a considerable current. The crew were waiting impatiently for orders from their leader. The latter, after carefully observing the animal, ordered the engineer to sail full steam 
towards the animal. Three cheers greeted this order. The hour of battle had sounded. A few moments later, the Abraham Lincoln headed straight for the animal. Unconcerned, the latter let us come nearer. It got up a little speed and kept its distance. This chase dragged on for about three quarters of an hour without the frigate getting any closer to the sea animal. At this rate, it was obvious that we would never catch up with it. The Abraham Lincoln gathered speed, but so did the animal. This went on for the next hour. The Abraham Lincoln was now speeding so much that its masts trembled down to their blocks. What a chase! No, I can't describe the excitement that shook my very being. Ned Land stayed at his post, harpoon in hand. Several times the animal let us approach. Then, just as the harpooner was about to strike, the cetacean would steal off swiftly. Commander Farragut then decided to use more direct methods. Bah, he said, so that animal is faster than the Abraham Lincoln. All right, mate, man the gun in the bow. Our forecastle cannon was immediately loaded and leveled. The cannoneer fired a shot, but his shell passed some feet above the cetacean, which stayed half a mile off. Over to somebody with better aim, the commander shouted and five hundred dollar to the man who can pierce that infernal beast. Calm of eye, cool of feature, and an old grey-bearded gunner. I can see him to this day, approached the cannon, put it in position, and took aim for a good while. There was a mighty explosion, mingled with cheers from the crew. The shell reached its target. It hit the animal, but bounced off its rounded surface and vanished into the sea two miles out. Oh, drat, said the old gunner in his anger. That monster must be covered with six-inch armor plate. The hunt was on again. Hour after hour went by without the animal showing the least sign of weariness. However, it must be said that we two struggled on tirelessly. At 10.50 in the evening, that electric light reappeared three miles away from the frigate, just as clear and intense as the night before. The monster seemed motionless. Was it asleep, perhaps? Weary from its workday? just riding with the waves. This was our chance, and Commander Farragut decided to take full advantage of it. He gave his orders. The frigate approached without making a sound, stopped two cable lengths from the animal. A profound silence reigned over the deck. We were not hundred feet from the blazing core of light, whose glow grew stronger and dazzled the eyes. Just then, leaning over the forecastle railing, I saw Ned Land below me, brandishing his dreadful harpoon. Barely twenty feet separated him from the motionless animal. All at once his arm shot forward and the harpoon was launched. I heard the weapon make a ringing sound as if it had hit some hard substance. The electric light suddenly went out and two enormous water spouts crashed into the deck of the frigate, racing like a torrent from one end of the ship to the other, toppling crewmen, breaking spare masts and yard arms from their lashings. A hideous collision occurred and thrown over the rail with no time to catch hold of it. I was hurled into the sea. Adapted from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne.